All right, you primitive screwheads, listen up. They're coming to get you, Barbara. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. Here's Johnny. Vanity. Definitely my favorite set. <laughs> I am the devil, and I am here to do the devil's work. The power of Christ compels you! This is my boomstick! What's your favorite scary movie? What up, horror heads, and welcome to Shiver, a horror movie podcast. We are your hosts. I'm Daniel Dabana. And I'm David Uyoa. And we are going to be joined later on this episode by his friend of the show, Ralph. Uh, he had some internet issues right before we got started, but we didn't want to leave you guys waiting too long. Because if you've been a fan of the show for a little while, you've heard us talk about this movie, especially Dave talk about this movie. He talks about this movie too much in other episodes. So it was bound to get its own episode eventually. And tonight we are going to be continuing the year of the monster, the month of the zombie. And we are going to be wrapping it up with return of the living dead. Now this movie is, it's a lot. It's mm -hmm. a lot. And I don't know that if we could have found a movie more diametrically opposed to what we did last week <laughs> with train to Busan. Like, I don't know that in the history of this podcast, we've ever gone one week to another and done two movies that were so outrageously different while having the same basic premise. It's yeah. absurd how different this movie is. So, we're going to get into it because I feel like this is one we're going to talk about. So in a section that we're calling Independence Day zombie style, I got to know, Dave, you talk about it all the time. We're actually kind of in a way reduxing this episode in Shiver history. We are a little bit. And so I need you to take me through. What do you think about Return of the Living Dead? Um, I described it in a certain way to ralph who hopefully will be joining us soon um i said it's the commando of horror movies <laughs> um and uh, if if you are um not even an occasional listener like if you've listened to an episode i've talked about how much i love commando <laughs> right. um this movie for me is maybe the horror movie i've seen most in my life there is uh there we go ralph's back hey, hey, ralph. Hey, ralph. Hey, ralph. Hey, ralph. Hey, ralph. welcome to ralph we're glad yeah. to have you <laughs> and ralph this, before we get too far into this is your first time seeing this movie right mm -hmm. yes hours ago for the first time <laughs> <laughs> yeah actually just crushed it because didn't know he was going to be on the show until <laughs> just a little bit ago dave's just in the middle of explaining to us how this is the commando of horror movie <laughs> yet yeah, there's um i don't think i have ever seen a movie that like just begged to be rewatched like this because it is so much fun. Um, it's, it's, it's so much fun. And because I, it's weird to say this because there's so little substance to this movie, right? <laughs> it ends up being the kind of movie that you want to constantly rewatch. There's a very basic premise. The premise is, uh, is then, made real by actors that are very clearly cartoon characters. Like these are <laughs> caricatures. These are not people. There's no attempt for them to be like people. Um, and in fact, like the people, the characters that are played closest to people are uh, the most level headed here. And they seem out of place. Yes. In this yeah, movie. They, they're the ones who seem like it's like, you don't belong in this movie. Yeah. Yeah, like you're you're gonna survive. You're gonna survive, and of course, no one does because they shouldn't. Because the, as 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 outlandish as this movie is, the basic premise I think is handled very reasonably, it, and and there's like science that goes into this. And of course, it's not real science, right? Uh, it's it, it's hokum, but it's hokum that I feel like in our real world setting makes sense to me. Yeah. The, the, the movie bothers with making sense just enough so that it can get you to the next laugh so that it can get you to the next holy fuck because this movie is 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 a roller coaster it never stops it's it, it basically from the moment that the canister busts open that you hear that amazing theme song play 
and 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 the title card comes onto the screen like the movie doesn't stop there is right. there's there's uh, it's it's a it's a roller coaster ride the entire time i fucking love this movie Yes, it's absolutely relentless. So from from a seasoned pro at this movie to an absolute virgin of this movie, Ralph, what do you think of Return of the Living Dead, man? Oh, my God. I, I keep telling him, I feel like if I stumbled onto the secret, I keep telling him, <laughs> does everybody know about this movie? This thing yeah. is fantastic. Like, I can't believe I've never seen it before. Yeah, it, it, minute 30, it's on. Like, yeah. I think they the canister at a minute 30, and then after that, it, it's crazy. I, I love that. It. It's fantastic. It is, and I think because it doesn't take itself seriously, but at the same time, it's it's fun. I think big budget movies now try to do that. Like I'm thinking, like at the Resident Evils and stuff, and it's like, oh my god, I mean, <laughs> I'd rather have this movie. You know, I just and I like that. It, it, I, like I said, and like I told the uh, uh, day before, certain movies you need the eau de fromage you need you need a little cheese on it <laughs> right <laughs> too much money it's just like it's so polished that it's just eh, i'm not into it you know yeah I love well, I love polished it. definitely not a word that applies to this movie but <laughs> no. in the best possible way i have a fantastic story about how i saw this movie for the first time so when i was in high school you know we always end up going back to these video store Mm -hmm. stories but it's just how it, it it worked out so i'm in high school uh, it's a friday night i'm 16 right so i've got my own car and me and my buddy are are gonna have a sleepover so we go to the video store we're like all right yeah let's let's like let's get something hor let's get let's get a horror movie let, you know let's let's have some fun with tonight and so we're walking around kind of looking and we're looking at different stuff and of course we're 16 so we're like commenting on whether or not there are boobs on the cover right like that's just like oh man look at this chick look at this chick and i shit you not this guy who worked there was probably like 16 also maybe 18 right <laughs> he, he goes he's like hey you guys uh you guys looking for for a fun horror movie we're like yeah and he's like and you're looking for one with boobs we're like yeah and he grabs this movie he's like come here <laughs> he's like he's like there's a chick in this movie that's naked the whole time we're like like all the way naked you know <laughs> and he's, like, yeah. he's like yeah butt ass naked full frontal it's amazing and then we're like is it scary he's like no not at all but you're gonna have so much fun watching this movie and so we're like all right we're sold and so we pick it up and we go back and we got like something else too and we had to like wait for my buddy's parents to go to bed Right. So they're like, oh, what'd you rent? I don't even remember what the other movie was like. Oh, yeah, we got this. They're like, OK, cool. So we're like hanging out, watching it. And eventually like, all right, we're going to go to bed. You know, y'all do whatever. And so it's like, all right, are they good in the sleep? All right. Yeah, let's put in the boobs movie. <laughs> so we, <laughs> And so we go to watch this thing. And it was it became a thing where we were having to stifle laughter so we wouldn't wake his parents up. Yeah, this movie is so ridiculously funny in so many ways. And, and the biggest way is it's 1,000% in on the joke. This is a movie that anytime it seems like it's taking itself seriously, like in the very beginning, immediately hits you with something that's just so outlandish or so ridiculous that you're immediately reminded that it is not taking itself seriously. It is absolutely the the hilarious like black sheep offspring of the George Romero Night of the Living Dead, you know, family. And right as I logged on before um before we were recording, Dave, you know the story of how this is allowed to talk about the movie Night of the Living Dead. Go would you like to impart that wisdom to our listeners? Yes, yeah, so I think that it's it's important for people to realize the pedigree that this movie has um, because it's very easy to like today, right? Um, there are so many movies that are meta right? That, that kind of are, you know, in on the various chronologies that exist, you know, within different universes and all this stuff. Um, but this wasn't done back in the eighties. So, um, I don't know what people did when they saw this and they were like, well, how the fuck are they doing that? That they're right. talking about night of the living dead movies didn't exist in movies back then. Right. So, um, the deal is that the, uh, the original night of the living dead from 1968, um, 
famously directed by George Romero, right? Um, but it was written by George Romero and another guy named John Russo. And John Russo is the guy who wrote and produced Return of the Living Dead. Um, the way the story goes, and uh, really there's only just like interviews of Romero and Russo talking about this. Um, so the way the story goes is that they had very different ideas of where they wanted to take the series. And so they had a, a very amicable split, uh, but a very legal split where um, kind of, you know, Romero said, I, I, I want to continue to take this into a, a serious space with lots of social commentary. And Russo just wanted to have fun. Right. Um, and I think they both thought they were making that movie with Return of the Li uh, Night of the Living Dead, uh, <laughs> because you can see elements of that in there. Yeah, because Night of the Living Dead is more over the top than the others are. Um, and then, of course, Dawn of the Dead is almost like comic booky to me. It looks like a comic book. And I think that's supposed to you know reflect where society was in that time. But um, you see some camp there that you don't see in the other movies. And that's where Romero went away from that he was like no no i i, I want to do the serious thing you know it's like yeah it, it, it's it's social commentary it's it's talking about the times and Ro and russo was like no i want like fart jokes that's, <laughs> that, that's that's what i want um i and and that's and that's what he did so he ended up writing a uh a novel called return of the living dead which he would use to shop around and so he got uh, Dan O'Bannon, who very famously wrote the the script for Alien, right, to direct this movie. And Dan O'Bannon had just before this directed a segment in the heavy metal movie. I don't know how, how familiar you are with heavy oh, metal, love heavy but metal. Uh, the um, the World War II plane sequence in heavy metal. Yeah, where the plane is shot down and uh, the pilot um, has to escape these zombies that like all the, the the crew of this plane turn into zombies and he parachutes out of the plane and he ends up on an island where there's all these other zombies. Um, I always assumed that O'Bannon was using this as an opportunity to to say uh, to, to MGM, I think, is is who um, uh, who produced this one. Uh, like, hey, listen, I can do this. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not just, uh, I'm not just a writer. I can also direct and, uh, fuck did he direct the fuck out of this one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, uh, just, just while we're talking Dan O'Bannon, by the way, have you ever seen dark star? Dude. So Carpenter's first movie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so good. Yeah. It's, it, it, it is a piece of shit, but it is the <laughs> right kind of piece of shit. <laughs> So this, I mean, so yeah, this movie just absolutely goes off the rails with, with everything, you know, there's, there's the, the framework of night of the living dead there. And, you know, I mean, like, obviously there, they talk about, oh, well they made this movie, but here's what really happened. So it, it acknowledges it exists, but then in that one little monologue kind of says, you know, but this is going to be a different thing. Cause they, mm -hmm. they changed some details of what happened. And I think that that's just a genius move to be like, okay, here's where we were. Here's where we're going now. All, all gas, no breaks. Like, and that's yeah. the only way to describe this movie. It is, it is relentless in its comedy, in its violence, in, in its, in its nudity. I mean, just yeah. everything about this movie is pure eighties camp. I like, I love, I love that. Oh, de fromage. Like, because that, that's what it is. I mean, it's, it's the best kind of cheesy. It was yeah. from beginning to end. It was fun to watch. It did have some legitimate scares in it. It, it did create the zombies as something to be afraid of. I, I just, a uh, man, I, I do. I love this. It was my first time seeing it in damn near third, probably 25 years since I've seen this movie, wow. but I, I love it. I love it. Um, so we, we I, I think you started to to go in this direction. So I'm just going to move us here. So in a section we're calling more brains. Mm -hmm. um, I, the the story here is I think one where I I wouldn't say that the story is inconsequential, but the story is nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's within that nonsense, I think there's a magic here. 
where um, you you just can't look away. And um, so tell me what you think. Um, so, D Daniel, I'm going to kick it to you since uh, since we went to Ralph before you last time. Um, how does the story work for you? I love this story because like you said it is it's the again it's it's the perfect kind of nonsense it's just like all right so yeah they made night of the living dead but they they changed some details because the army made them and this chemical <laughs> company is it, it was real and guess what right here in the basement we have some of the chemical you know and you're immediately you're like okay mm -hmm. this is dumb but i love it and, and, and they set up how dumb that can be right at the beginning when it's like this is a true story these are their real names these are, and the these are the names of the corporations it's like oh come the fuck on man yeah it's like monty python level slapstick and so you immediately get into so then and then it immediately becomes you know your standard just survive somehow mm -hmm. right you're 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 just trying to get through the night but i love that you know we always talk about how wonderful it is when someone takes the genre these days and finds a way to fundamentally change it to kind of flip something massive so this movie released in 85 immediately takes like the number one thing about zombies which is destroy the brain and they die mm -hmm. and it's like yeah no, that doesn't fucking work turns out that's a detail they changed and shouldn't have right so now we just have this group of, of just amazing characters just trying to survive the night. We've got a group of punks that are, they are the 80s punk aesthetic that made me fall in love yeah. with the genre. Like every single, and, and not just like your straight up, like, you know, sex pistols, gross bodily harm punks. Like there's mod punks mixed in with them and they're all hanging out and, just and so we've got them they're trying to survive in a cemetery we've got this guy who's one of their friends who just started working in this warehouse that has now been sucked into all of this and it just becomes you know what can we do how are we gonna make it you know what happens next and so while the story is nonsense and the right kind of nonsense inconsequential not the right word but it is a thread that just strings together all of these things. And it's it's a sturdy thread, but it's just enough of a thread to to kind of pull this movie through and get you from one what the fuck to the next, oh my God. And so I just, I think that the story here is exactly what it needed to be because I feel like what they were after, what Russo and O'Bannon were after for this movie was to remember that movies are a visual medium. And so they tell the story through what you're seeing happening. Ralph. And something that came to mind when, 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 uh, when Danny was speaking, correct me if I'm wrong. They're not slow zombies, are they? No, no they they're not. They, they actually, yeah. Cause in 28 days later, Oh, they're not slow, but I'm like, wait a second. This is one of the earlier ones and they weren't slow and they speak. They're yeah. really smart. Like I think, and they're pretty, and like he was saying, like you can't kill them just by bashing their brains. They're pretty indestructible. Like they're a sizable enemy. I thought it yeah. was great. I mean, they're taking it as a joke, but if you really see it, I mean, the movie is good. The, yeah, this is the scariest version of the zombie, I think, because um, we see something similar to this in uh, Army of Darkness, where Ash is like zombie evil um, alter ego is really intelligent and is able to like organize an army. Uh, like these these guys could definitely take over the world. The, the, yeah. The ending is the only ending it could possibly have. I, I, yeah. I was thinking when I was looking at the counter, because again, it's 90 minutes, which is fantastic. No, it's a I was like, exactly oh, 90 minutes. <laughs> there's no way to fix this. And, right, and talk about smart. The zombie cop just calling the other zombies. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> it's amazing. He said that he even put the, he even put like the rain cover yeah. on like the cop hat. So it was like, it was a hundred percent sell. And then it's like a, and then it's just a straight up like medieval ambush. Like they get him in a, small space with one way in and one way out and then and then collapse on them from the sides it's so good and the zombies even speak 
Yeah, said yeah. more paramedics. <laughs> <laughs> it was and great. They, and they changed the voice of the zombies just enough. Like there's a little bit of modulation happening there so that um, so that you understand like, no, he's speaking, but he's dead. Uh, like if you didn't get it, right? right. It's like, oh, no, no, that's a, that's a dead guy. <laughs> so Dave, tell, you tell us about the story, man. Okay, so um, this is an inconsequential part of the story. Um, but the fact that this movie takes place on 4th of July, <laughs> I think, is is amazing. Because, number one, it gives me an excuse to watch this movie on the 4th of July every year. This is right. a little tradition that I have. Um, after everyone has gone to sleep and I am absolutely trashed. Yeah, just because it's the 4th of July, America. I, I sit on my couch and I put this movie on. And no matter how tired I am from all the pool from all of the the really sad vegan hot dogs that I eat, <laughs> from all the beer, I still managed to stay awake the whole way through. And 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 the the moment the bomb goes off, I'm like, okay, that's it. Now it's time to go to bed. And I get up and I go to bed. But it has become a tradition for me. And it's it's like one little insignificant part of the story. But that's what I feel this movie is. It's a movie that's made up of tiny little insignificant parts that add up to a solid whole. Because t take that that opening monologue between Frank and 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 Fred, right? Um, there's little things that Frank does that, like, okay, it's not part of the story. It's not really important, but like those faces that he makes. Like the body, <laughs> yeah. like that. it's all those little moments that make up this movie where it's like, holy shit, right? Because they very easily could have come out from the basement and heard the banging on on the you know the 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 ice box door, right? And boom, your thing starts. But that's not what they did. They gave us little moments. Where's where's that dog? And then, and then the split dog is oh my god that was awesome. know, a vivisected dog coming back to life yeah. is such a genius man. And then the butterflies start flapping their yes. wings, awesome. you know. And and then we get where the real magic is, right? The story moves forward. It's like okay, we've set things up for you. Here you go, right? And it's not, it doesn't make sense because Fred knows what's in there. It's a dead body. And he says, anyway, who's in there? <laughs> and then Frank's response is even better. Now, I don't know, but he sounds sore. <laughs> <laughs> what the, like, he knows. He knows who's in there, you know? And it's those little, little things that make up this movie. And no matter how many times I've seen this movie, because I constantly watch this movie in various states of inebriation, I pick up new things about this movie. I, I've i seen this movie once or twice a year, sometimes more, uh, every year since 2009. And, right. and I am still picking out little things here. Still. Yeah, I mean, and that is the thing. Like, it's just every time somebody has a conversation, right? It's, it, there's, there's like little little ways like you were talking about the face or just little funny things they say or i just like the one-liners in this movie are just so great where it's like oh i think about sex and i think about death it's like oh okay then fuck off and die you know yes, like, yes. <laughs> no, yes. have some respect for the dead yes the punk <laughs> won't sleep with her and he says that yes. he's a... you know he he's he's like dude like this gorgeous woman is throwing herself at you, right? And suit and his name is suicide, suicide. right? So it's so it's you like think okay, this is a costume. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a way of life. This is a this way is a of life. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and, and those those little things there, where like you really come to see that like these characters are more than just characters; they're caricatures. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's not that they live lives; they don't, but they exist wholly in that world. Yeah. In that world, there is an entire persona that was built for us to sit back and enjoy. And I think one of the ones that I enjoy the most is Ernie's. Ernie's persona, right? Did any of you guys pick up on the fact that he is 
probably Hitler Youth, and uh, his dad is probably one of the highest ranking uh, Nazis ever to live. Okay, so, mortuary guy, right? Or, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, I, he has I, a Luger. I, yeah, yeah. He, 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 his dad's got a Luger, <laughs> and he's and he's wearing the thin strap red suspenders that are very yes. much like a skinhead <laughs> thing, like like the the like sh- the the straps and Doc Martens. You know, that's like Hitler used skinhead uniform one hundred and one. And so, as soon as I saw the suspenders, I immediately I did. I started googling, and I was like. Was this the skinhead uniform in the eighties? And it's like, okay, it is. So I, I, I had that feeling. So uh, his name is Ernie Kaltenbrunner, right? <laughs> and um, Ernst Kaltenbrunner was one of the architects of the Holocaust. Oh shit! <laughs> yeah. Um. So subtle. If you don't know your uh your history, your 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 World War II history, right? And like, why would anyone remember the name Ernst Colton Brunner. Yeah, right? exactly. Like I, I think here, here in the United States, like obviously everyone knows the name Hitler, but there's a couple of other ones. Like maybe, right. you know, like Himmler and right, Goebbels. Goebbels. Yeah. So like, there's like those, those high ranking guys that just because of history, we know these people, but there were so many little things that I picked up on. Right. Because he's, he's looking out at the rain coming down and he says something in German. And I was like, okay, like I don't speak German, but I'm pretty good at deciphering things. And he says it's coming down like, like a drunken soldier, like, like a, uh, or, or like, like the, like the, the piss of a drunken soldier, is what he says. Because I, re- I, I, I got the word drunk, right, and soldier, and I was like, dude. That's just way too many things. He's he, he's, he's got a he's got a, a Walther P thirty eight right. He's got the um, he's got the name, the hair right. His thing is that he loves to dissect bodies and burn bodies. Right? Yeah. Lo and behold, Colton Bruner is this dude. So like this movie's filled with those little things, and then like the the things that happen don't ever just happen because. Right. So it's not just that, like, the zombies rise because, like, no, they burned this zombie. Right. The smoke went up in the air and the rain brought all that shit back down. And since we know that they're indestructible, why would something like uh, transubstantiation make a fucking <laughs> difference? Right. Science. It's, it's, yeah, yeah it's, exactly. It's <laughs> pseudoscience. Right. But it is science in a way. And then we get those lines that um, that Frank gives us. You know, he's like, oh, some big favor. Like I could operate this thing. Lo and behold, he is the you know, he puts himself in that thing yeah. and he fucking burns himself up. And what a great character moment for him. Yes. Because oh. he, he takes off the wedding ring, you know, and like he's he, he's about to turn. He goes, I, 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 I can't live this way. And his wife is the last thing that we're, you know, that, that he's he's thinking of. It's there's there's really great moments in this movie. And I I, I think that's that's what I've, I've been trying to talk about this this whole time as I've been rambling on is that this movie is a collection of amazing moments that all add up to one even more amazing movie. And it's very genuine. That yeah. moment's very genuine for such mm-hmm. a goofy movie. It's like, wow, you know, I didn't expect that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, the the flip side of that coin is some of the moments are so absolutely ridiculous that that you're immediately reminded like what you're in mm-hmm. so, some of some of the the most absurd things like in in the in the scheme of all of this that was happening that I noticed when the the one skeleton eventually comes back out like you see that it's like a skeleton comes up mm-hmm. through and it's like well. One, everything about that body is gone, so why would it be affected if it's just bones? But also, it still has eyeballs. It has eyeballs. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so apparently, everything about this body has completely decayed. Still, twenty twenty on the vision, right? Like those <laughs> yeah. things are still donatable. The um the the army general or whatever who I guess has been spending twenty mm-hmm. years trying to find these chemicals, he goes into what looks like maybe his dining room and you see him put in a code into what is a China cabinet and pull it open. And it's got all this high tech equipment behind it. But if we could just take a second to acknowledge how absolutely ridiculous it is to put a code on something that the front of it is just glass. 
<laughs> like there's <laughs> you're, you're not keeping anybody out of that chief if they really want in there they're getting in there the, and so it's those things that are the the other side of the little moments mm -hmm. coin right um I actually, if you're listening and you've not seen this movie for a while, I actually called the number on the canisters because oh. I immediately noticed, ooh, that's not a 555 number. That may do something. Now, while I cannot speak to where this number called in 85, I can tell you now with authority that sex phone lines still exist. Oh, <laughs> no way. That's if hysterical. You, if you call 1-800-454-8000, it's a fucking party line. Oh, and man, girls man. get to talk for free. And I hung up before it told me how much it was going to cost me. <laughs> I did, because my, like, my immediate thought was like, okay, maybe this is just part of the gag. Right. So it was like, press one if you're a guy. And I was like, okay. And so I pushed <laughs> one and then it immediately starts talking. And it was like, for the low cost of, I was like, and we're done. But <laughs> you, so that, that number, and like I said, in 85, that may have not been what it was, but in my head, I like to imagine that they just snagged this number off of late night TV and sprayed it on the front of these canisters just to create another one of those little moments for all the people who are going to take the time because I am that guy. You show me a website and a movie. I'm going to that website mm -hmm. and I will rain down fire upon you. If I find out that you didn't actually create that website. <laughs> uh, and I get, I like there were, there were, there is nothing so inconsequential that makes me more mad than if there's a website in the movie and I go to it and it doesn't pop up what they saw in the movie. It pisses me off every time. And so this number finding out it that it's just as easy to build the website as it is to like Photoshop a fake website in there. Exactly. And I will say four out of five times it does really exist. Even if everything you click doesn't actually go anywhere. Uh, How I met your mother was always genius about this. They would just create a homepage and it would have a ton of links, but then none of them went anywhere. Um, but yeah, so this number actually does, uh, it calls a phone sex line, which I guess is still operating well enough. I, I assume there's like some Apple II somewhere just set up to a phone bank, keeping this thing alive in a warehouse that's been run down since the 90s and no one knows it's still there. My God, that's awesome. Yeah. And so, you know, like I said, the the little things that keep it ridiculous, it's it's a this movie is expertly tightrope walks like mm -hmm. all of those things and that's what ends up making the story so fun and you you care what's bizarre is you care about these caricatures they're not just cannon fodder they're not just idiot teenagers like you 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 do kind of care because you you really just want to see what they're going to do next because they're mm -hmm. all so weird and so different and you want them to survive as well. Like there's there's that awesome moment, which is a funny moment, uh, between uh, is it Casey, Casey and uh, Chuck, where um, she looks at him and she says, "I never did like you." But right, hold me. <laughs> You know, and it's like, it's a tender moment, but it's also like, bro, you, you've been destroying this guy, the whole fucking movie. She was, uh, she did not do a, um, a cast call. She really? was, she was given the job by wow. Dan O'Bannon because she was his favorite dancer at a strip club that he would go to uh. all the time. And yes. uh, yeah, and uh, it's the American he, dream, really. He was, he was like, you know what? I'm making a movie. And she was like, yeah, sure you are. He was like, no, no, I really am. And you'd be perfect <laughs> for this role. And she was like, are you serious? He goes, yeah, it's yours I mean, if you want it. I mean, I've said that before at a strip club. But <laughs> <laughs> I've never made a movie. <laughs> like, no, no, ser seriously, I am. I make, I make movies. <laughs> I was going to ask if, uh, if the actress that's naked throughout the whole movie it, was she a an adult star or a stripper? Because it just no. I mean no. She's no. Bald, so, man. Uh, she is naked the whole time. L Linnea Quigley is is the name of the actress, and she's a scream queen. Like she yeah. went on to do a wow. ton of other movies, and um, 
She's, so, in, she's in the original Silent Night, Deadly Night. Yes, she is. Um, so interesting thing about the the striptease and 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 the dance, right? So they're filming this thing like late at night, and they've got like the flares, the flares, <laughs> and all that. Um, and so she she strips and she does it right. And the first take goes great, and Dan O'Bannon turns to the producer. Uh, to John Russo and he was like can we do this and he was <laughs> like I don't know <laughs> and they were like we need to make it less um, like in your face and so they turned to her and they say you know what can you shave and she's <laughs> like you sure and they're like it's drawing so much attention to your vagina like we feel like if you shave it's not going to draw attention down there and everyone will be looking like from the chest up. And she goes, okay, if you think so. So she goes into her trailer, <laughs> she shaves, wow. she comes back. They do the scene again and everything seems fine until the flares come out. And then you see everything. Yeah. And so, uh, it, O'Bannon and Russo were like, cut, cut, cut. They're like, it's worse. And she's like, I can't put it back. <laughs> so they had to like, just, okay, we're going to do this with you completely shaven. That was not like the style right. back in 1985. And so I've uh, seen plenty of documentaries from the eighties and I can, I can attest to the fact that, yeah, yeah. Uh, Brazilian was not the move. No, no. Or they so, actually made a Merc and yeah, back, they would make right. a bigger one just yeah. to cover more. I can't believe that they would say, <laughs> take it off. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's just the, the strangest thing. I don't know why they did give her like, um, a a, 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 something to kind of suction up there. Uh, right and, and and stop looking at the the vulva at the very right right um, it was, there was definitely a lack of lines there was almost a Barbie doll look it was yeah yeah was. So, but I guess they didn't it didn't occur to them to do this until after they had shot the graveyard <laughs> scene uh, because all, all the scenes where where trash is the uh, is the zombie trash um, she has some sort of covering down there you can right. see it yeah it's something yeah new. yeah. There, there was, you know, a couple other lines that that are uh, one particular line that really got me because I could it it meant a lot more in today's age than it meant to in eighty five at least to me personally, right? So when I saw this originally was pre Katrina, so mm -hmm. when he's like, "These are made by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers," and he hits it and it busts <laughs> open. <laughs> Post Katrina, that being the largest fail of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in my <laughs> lifetime, that sh I had to pause the goddamn movie. Like I was in tears at the fact that that was the last thing he said, and then he hits it, and the 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 metaphorical levy breaks on this on this tank, and I lost my shit. And I was like, I was like, oh my, I was like, I hope that this joke hit as hard in 85 as it does now, because I, we're far enough away now that we can laugh at that. And yeah. I was, I was, like I said, there were tears streaming down my face. And yeah, what you said, what, that's minute 30, like two minutes into the movie, right? Yeah. That we're already into this whole thing. And that's when I was like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm remembering now it's coming back just some of those just some of those fantastic things are uh, it's just there's there's so many things to laugh about things that are you know it actual jokes and things that are visual gags mm -hmm. and but like we said just a second ago on top of all of that you never lose the humanity of the characters that are in this. I mean, we, we've done Texas, you know, the new Texas chainsaw and stuff like that and referred to characters as cannon fodder. We just mm -hmm. want to see them killed. That wasn't what I got from this movie, even though they were so absurd and in, in every bit of the story and every action that they took. I never was actively rooting for the zombies necessarily. I right. was, I was invested in these people. And I think that that's always going to be the hallmark 
of what makes a good zombie film because in it in in the at its absolute core and i think we've talked about this a little bit for three movies now at its absolute core you've got to tell a human story you've mm -hmm. got to create something where people are invested in the survival of the people or else it's it's not really a zombie movie. So if you make it comedy, you know, you, you've you got to, you and the, the characters are outlandish. You still have to want them to make it. You still have to be invested. And for this movie coming out, what, 36 years ago at this mm -hmm. point, it's amazing that the groundwork for all of these other things that we've seen since then was laid then so honestly early in the genre of zombie films. Yeah, because, I mean, it, 85 might seem like a long time ago, but um, if you start thinking really, um, like, this is only a, a, a couple of years after Night of the Living Dead. I mean, we're, we're talking about, like, what, like a, a 17, 17 year years. period from, from Night of the Living Dead. So th this really – and how many zombie movies came after that? Like, yes, right. you, you had a, a, a couple of, like, copycat movies that come out after Dawn of the Dead, uh, particularly from, from Italy. But there's not really that many. So this is – it kind of marks, like, the – maybe fifth or sixth major entry into the 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 zombie subgenre of horror and one of the things that you keep talking about you know the, the human element of here um i think it's a great time to transition into a section we're calling punks and sellouts um our our cast of characters right um and we've talked a lot about them already but i i, I want to get into like re really get into like their performances the the actors the characters like what resonated with you ralph i'll, I'll throw it to you first it, i think none of them sell out i think the fact that they're punks and i guess in 85 you're supposed they're supposed to be like oh outsiders and all that but they're they're the most real person it's what daniel was saying i care about them and mm -hmm. this is going to be extreme but compared to like oppenheimer i don't care about anybody yeah, it's fair. Hundred million dollar movie. It won a bunch of Oscars, but Christopher Nolan, uh, he's a great craftsman, but he's so cold. There, I don't care about these people. Yet this goofy movie, <laughs> you guys are right. I'm rooting for all of them. When they killed, um, what's his, Danny, the the main punk? I was like, oh wow, I didn't think he was gonna die. Yeah, I really didn't think any of them were gonna die. Somehow, I, I wanted them to make it. Yeah. Or when the the I forget her name, the 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 good girl. The, the virginal type. Yeah, Tina. She was a goner. She falls Tina, through the yeah. steps and stuff like that. I really I really was rooting for these guys. And, yeah, I don't think any of them really sell out. Other than poor, is it Fred, that he has a job? And yeah. they're hiding for it. They, yeah, which he sells out. But everybody else is, you know, is in there. And they care about each other. Even, um, I don't know the name of the characters, but uh, Miguel Nunez. Spider. Oh, spider, yeah. yeah you want a man. Has, when he's like, come back, we can't leave him, whatever. And the the glue car uh, Gallagher character is like, we're, we're going to go get help. And he's like, no, no, but those are my, you know, like, those are his friends. It's like, wow, mm -hmm. you really care about these guys. I really wanted them to survive. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, I uh, just, like I said, just as soon as it starts and we see him for the first time in the spray painted car and, you know, they've got the chains and it and it's all of the things that were basically the the textbook on how to be a punk. Right. In, in like the 70s and 80s. Uh, but I wasn't I, I'm not opposed to that because, like I said, I, I fell in love with that aesthetic. Like when I when I got into punk, that was what. That aesthetic is what I started basing like everything I did about the way I dressed and stuff on. So I love that. When it comes to the actual characters, I love, I loved suicide because I love that when we first get him, like he's almost like this disgruntled father figure. Yeah. To this, to this <laughs> punk collective. You know, he's like, you guys only call me when you need a ride. And then he gets his, you know, he gets his deep punk monologue about how this isn't a costume. I just, I fucking, I love that. Right. Because I've, I knew dudes like that when, when I was, when I was in that scene, right. Those guys who got just really upset. If, if somebody they knew, yeah, got a job. I'll like, oh, fuck that guy. He's a sellout. And it's like, you know, the whole starving artist thing is kind of overdone. Right. So I, I did. I thought that I thought that suicide was great. I love that, you know, trash is just 
throwing herself at him. And this is a guy who's so deep in contemplative thought about his way of life and, and how people treat him because of the way he looks. It's, it was so bizarre, but it wasn't out of place. No, right. It, it, it was, it was, it was, it was weird, but it fit. And that's how all of them are. Like I said earlier, I love that there were even some mod punks in there, you know, so they've got their suits and their skinny ties and all of that. And, and it really just shows kind of how that scene was down to the fact that um, Fred, Frank, uh, the, the one Fred. who got the job, Fred. Yeah. yeah. Um, that it showed like what, you know, Fred, we're talking about that maybe he was Hitler youth or something like that. And so your initial thought is like, well, why would he end up with this crew? But there's actually a deep seated history in punks coming from and or infiltrating, uh, I mean, uh, Hitler youth, neo-Nazis coming from and or infiltrating the punk scene. It was it was an epidemic in the scene in the 70s uh, for this to happen. Uh, uh, Strummer very famously like had to go on record as being like, we hate Nazis. Y'all can fuck off. Yeah. Don't come to our shows. <laughs> but, and, and it, it because it, it, um, if, if I'll do my bit of history now, it actually started because punks in an effort to be, to, to just be outlandish in everything they did and everything they did had to be so controversial. They started just wearing swastikas because that was going to draw eyeballs and it was going to make them outsiders. Even if they had nothing to do with Nazism, it was, it was eye catching. And so then it became one of those like self-fulfilling prophecy things where neo-Nazi groups started going to punk shows and then recruiting these disenfranchised youths and that, and it, it, it like, it got their attention. They showed up and suddenly Nazi punks were a very real thing during this time. So again, even if he is Hitler youth in this movie, it's super fucking weird, but it makes sense mm -hmm. for everything that's happening within here. And that was what I kept coming back to every time somebody would say something ridiculous. Every time a character seemed even more outlandish. Oh, all I think about is death. It's like, <laughs> yeah, but we've all known that girl who was way too into her goth phase, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> it's, it's all so absurd, but not once did I ever be like, oh, this character doesn't fit that, that right. guy's motivations don't make any sense. The cast of characters here is eclectic and it's just it's awesome and they're it's it's funny and it's eye catching and it's a little bit of everything and like i said my my absolute favorite though was was just suicide because just his his little moment there in the cemetery caught me um man, i'm i'm right there with you on everyone because there's literally not a single character that I think like, man, oh, this guy's on screen again. You know, right. and then, now I guess is the time for me to go, um, you know, refill my popcorn or something. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll talk about um, kind of the, the, the only two people that I, I think weren't mentioned and um, very possibly they are my favorite characters here uh, because we talked about Frank and Freddie like a lot. So I'm not going to talk about those two, um, but Clue Gulliger as Bert and Don Kalfa as Ernie, uh, the owners of the, the mortuary and the medical supply store, uh, which I love that it's called You Need a Medical Supply. You need it? <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. Um, these two guys are kind of like the elder statesman here, even though I'm fairly certain that the uh, the character that played Frank is older, uh, James Karen. Um, these two guys are kind of like the adults because Frank in many ways is just as immature and just as childish as uh, as Fred. So um, Clue Gulliger is one of these actors where when he shows up, I am going to laugh he has a way of just affecting you and he's been he's, he's been, been in one of the this. nightmares right yeah he was in nightmare 2 and there he it was is. he was very very funny 
in Nightmare yes. 2. Um, and in fact, when we talked about cast, he's who I talked about when uh, w- when we talked about Nightmare 2. Um, he has that that one line that always makes me just I, I have to pause the the, the movie um, when Ernie tells him, he goes, oh, well, um, what do you got in there? Those um, rabid weasels. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the way Ernie's face is just like. Well, call call a shelter, call the humane society. I don't think that's gonna work, Ern. <laughs> it's just like what and he just fuck? says it straight though. Yeah, he yeah. Breaks, like he's like boom. Never. I, like and, it, even when he gets that movie, he's like, all right, all right, bring it in, bring it in. Let me let me let me bring yeah. this for you. Let me yeah. let me bring this down. You know, it's like it, it's 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 one of those things where it seems like it should be delivered comedically, but he's like, mm, right, right in here. All right, so that, that dry those are body parts. deadpan delivery is just it, it it makes the movie man it absolutely makes the movie um he's 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 brilliant from start to finish i love it there's um i noticed and this is one of the things that i noticed upon this rewatch um in the office there's a um there's like a an eye exam chart right and the eye exam chart says bert is a slave driver <laughs> no, really? yeah yeah, yeah. I, I never noticed that uh <laughs> I paused and I'm like, that says Bert. Bert is a oh my god, Bert is a slave driver. <laughs> I have to see this. Yeah, I see it again. Um, it's it's towards the beginning of the movie because it's it's in the. No, I remember the eye chart. I just didn't. I said I yeah. didn't know and it didn't say anything. Um. So and then Don Kalfa is Ernie. Um. He plays. Um. In Weekend at Bernie's, he plays the best character in the movie, which is the hitman. Yes. Um, and and that's um that's where I first met Don Calfa was you know with with Weekend at Bernie's. And so when I saw him again here, I was like, "Oh fuck, we're in for something." And he just like revels in this role as like this guy who's like just so morbid and obsessed with with with, with death in an entirely different way than these punks are. And yet somehow seems more legitimate, even though he's the guy who's like actually dealing with death. Right. Um, he it, it's because of his sort of like weird you know, fascination with the dead that we find out everything that has to do with zombies eating brains, which this is, in fact, the first movie where zombies eat brains. Prior to this, they just ate people. Right. And um, and now it's like, no, we eat brains because it helps with the pain of being dead. Yeah. And and it's it's a it's a a brilliant character trait of his that helps bring about a brilliant plot point in the movie that helps differentiate this. And and this is why I say that the movie's made up of moments of beautiful, hysterical, gory moments that help make this movie the the, the magical thing where it is where um, some like Ralph, who's watching this movie for the first time, is like, why the fuck am I finding out now in 2024? Why am I finding out about this movie fucking today? Yeah. And it, it, it's yeah. because of moments like that with Don Calfa, where where he's just trying to figure shit out, where it's just it, I love the moment at the end of the movie. Where playing into his character and his whole thing, you know, he is obsessed with death, but whatever is going on with these people has nothing to do with death. So that moment where it seems like Frank is about to bust in, where Freddie is about to bust into the attic, he takes out his gun mm-hmm. and he's, he's got it aimed at her head. And it's almost a little thing you don't even notice. Yeah, he's that. thinking about it. And, and he's like, I, the moment that he comes in, I am going to shoot you so that you don't have to turn into one of these things. And if it weren't for the fact where Tina says, like, do you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> like, he's like, hear what? It, it, it's it, it's just it's perfect. I uh, couple two other characters that I just have to mention, because, again, hilarious in how not funny they were. The paramedics. In this yeah. movie, <laughs> are amazing. Mm-hmm. There's, <laughs> I've known, I know guys who are well, like, I know people who work in hospitals. I've known guys who have driven ambulances and been paramedics. 
And I don't know a single person who, upon finding a walking, talking human <laughs> with no pulse and a blood pressure of zero over zero, is just going to calmly be like, ah, we'll get the stretchers and see if we can get this figured. <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. Again, just that moment where they're so matter of fact about it. They're mm -hmm. not freaked out at all. Like they're concerned. But in no way are they just panicking like, okay, this is bad. Something awful is happening. They are just 100% matter of fact about it. Mm -hmm. You know, there it, it, it was, it was so ridiculous because basically once the zombies start showing up, every time somebody's talking, they're screaming at somebody else for the rest of this movie. And somebody is always screaming at somebody, but not those two guys. Not the two guys that have a legitimate reason to scream and to <laughs> run. They're like, they're walking out there, put their rain jackets on, just casually strolling to get the stretchers. And it's like, you've just seen, this is breaking science. Like yeah. <laughs> something, something awful or something wonderful has happened here. Put some pep in your step, big guy. <laughs> they even have an aside. And it, they're yeah, very yeah. They're like, well, give us a second. And they step aside yeah. and you see it. <laughs> I'm like trying to figure it out. It, oh, just, it was again like you talk about little things. These are inconsequential characters that don't even have names, but they mm -hmm. add so much to the movie that you 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 love it. And so, you know, while I'm talking about characters without names, there is a whole host of other characters <laughs> that we've got to get into as we talk about here. And there's going to be some comparison. There, there's going to be some back and forth. But in the section that we are just calling zombies, we've got to talk about the actual zombies. You can pick mm -hmm. actual ones you want to talk about. Talk about the the, the dynamics of and the, the science of what makes this zombie, however you want to do it. But with the time we've got left, let's dive into the zombies that we've got here. Dave, start us off on this one. Okay. Um, this may be controversial, but my favorite look for a zombie ever is Tar Man. Okay. Um, are there more iconic zombies? Sure. Uh, plaid shirt zombie from Dawn of the Dead is one of the most iconic zombies of all time. I mean, he was the poster, right? Right. Um, Bub from Day of the Dead is absolutely fantastic. Uh, the first zombie you meet in night of the living dead the really tall dude in the suit right because he's just been buried yeah um iconic uh the little girl that kills her mother at the end of that movie iconic but there's something about tar man <laughs> there's something magical about him the moment that you see tar man in his full tarry glory Wow, dude, that did something to me as an impressionable 22-year-old when I saw this movie. I was like, oh, my God, that's a zombie. Yeah. It, it wasn't, this is a dude in makeup, that's really good makeup. Wow, what a great zombie effect. I looked at that and I said, that's a zombie. I don't think any other movie has ever made me do that since either. Right. There's there's something in his movement, uh, like on on top of like the amazing look that he has. There's something to his movement that is just it's it's magical because like his body is so decomposed that like he he can't walk. It's like a weird shuffle he's got to do, and like none of his tendons are working, so he can't stand up straight either. It's it's brilliant. Because, like, the classic zombie walk that George Romero talks about with rigor mortis, so, you know, they're going to kind of move very stiff. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And if you take John Russo's approach, it's like, no, nah, man, you break out rigor mortis. And they talk about it there. Right. right? You got to break out the rigor mortis. And once that's been broken out, now you can move the body freely. And that's why these zombies can run. Right. Um, there is... This is the scariest zombie of all the zombie apocalypses 
this is the last one I want to face because there is no stopping them. There is right. no way to stop them. And because if you burn them, all that shit will just rise. And eventually it's going to rain and it's going to bring it back down and it's just going to keep going again. This is, I think, the ultimate zombie. I don't think there is any more ultimate weapon than this because really that's what you can look at these things as um the, if the military decided to drop 245 trioxin on on its enemy and turn them into these things they would take care of their own country for the US government done uh it, it's and and then you kind of just have to drop a, a, a an atomic bomb to clean it up and uh and then lather rinse repeat yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's that is the thing about this zombie is it is this is a zombie apocalypse because you can't win this one because we've been shown that they're always going to come back. What do you think about these zombies, Ralph? My favorite one is the half woman zombie, the green thing with the Ooh, yes. That is because <laughs> then she's in the table, the spine is just like doing this, and, and there's she, spinal fluid coming out yeah. as she whips her. And it her wasn't spine. an actress; I think it was all it was animatronic. Switch. Yeah. But it was really good. Like for a cheap movie or not having such a big budget, I thought that one was like, wow, when she speaks and she's the one that says, you know, the, the brain and the pain and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It was fantastic. I mean, that was my the one that stood out. Either that or just when when they're pre-zombies, like the cop that's just white and he's just signaling <laughs> the other guys. I love that. Or I think there was a Civil War guy. Yeah. Like, you know, says more paramedics. Something yeah. like that. More so it's either the green zombie or the the so-so zombie guys. Yeah, that was, that was yeah. my favorite. These zombies are the scariest zombies to me because of the fact that we we see them. You know, they're they're fully mobile, they're intelligent. I think that that sets the. I think that that sets it off. In, you know, in Day of the Dead, we start to get intelligence returning to zombies. You know, with Bub, and he's kind of going back, and he puts on the headphones and. And he's uh and and he's he's starting to get memories back. That's expanded upon in Land of the Dead, where they 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 start to remember things that mm -hmm. they used to do. But these zombies come back and are instantly intelligent. Like they seem to return with whatever intelligence they died with. And like I said, I mean they set up a booby trap. They, I mean, it, 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 you know that's that's supposed to be the one way we win. Right, is we're supposed we're to be the yeah. ones who can set yeah. traps and we can outsmart them, and now you know by by the standards of this movie, you know your Einsteins are on their side now, right? right. We just got to make sure it rains <laughs> on the right grave, and and we're screwed because you know they they've got they've got you know Genghis Khan, he's <laughs> he's on their side now, right? <laughs> like these are this is horrifying, um, and I. As I watched this, I did wonder if this was the first time that zombies eating brains was actually a thing because it becomes like a touchstone moment in this movie. And so you're saying this actually is the first time where it's like they're out for brains. So, yeah. you know, I love that. I love that they're this idea that, yeah, it, it helps with the pain of existing, Right, which is what on the one line exactly like on the surface, it's like, oh, okay, well, yeah, it hurts to be alive because you're supposed to be dead. Mm -hmm. But then on the other one, it's like, uh, life is pain, princess, right? Like, you know, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you start to look at that and it's like, ah, that's because you can, you know, there's, there, there's gotta be somebody out there who's written a paper like on that line. Right. And about, mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, like, cause the, the immediate thought I had was that, uh, that really it's at this point, just cliche quote that people say where they're like, Oh, hurt people, hurt people. Right. right? And so, but then, then it's like, you apply it to this and it's like, I mean, that's what they're doing. Right. Like, and, and then like a living person who is, who is depressed or something like that is metaphorically eating the brains of their mm -hmm. friends. Right. So you start to like unpack all of these things. That, Our, that reminds me of like what we do in the shadows, uh, <laughs> like, like the energy vampires. Yes. Energy vampires. Exactly. <laughs> Colin Robinson. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Colin Robinson. <laughs> and so you, the, the beauty of this movie and, and the zombies that we get here are, 
without the in your face social commentary that Romero gave us, you can unpack things that happen here and the way that these zombies are portrayed and you can read into it and find social commentary. You can create your own head canon. You know, what was the intention? Does not matter anymore? It's, it's been 40 years. And, you know, we always talk about that. I, when we're talking about how frightening these zombies are, it can be summed up in what is one of the very final scenes and that's when Freddie is trying to get into the attic mm -hmm. and he starts playing on Tina's emotions. I mean, he, he can't physically hurt her because he's on the other side of this attic door. So he starts abusing her emotionally and there is no other way to describe what he's doing. Yeah, that yeah. Is, what he does is textbook emotional yeah. abuse. You, you, you made me hurt my hand. You Tina. made yeah. me hurt myself to get out. Now I've broken mm. my hand trying to get to you. This is your but it's fault. But it's okay because I love you, Tina. Oh yeah. my God. It. I have chills right now remembering that. Yeah. Because that exact dialogue you take that and you put it in that in a movie of some maniac who abuses his wife and she's finally had enough and is fighting back and that exact dialogue fits into a movie that's not funny yeah. at all and that's what gets me about these zombies they're manipulative because like i said ultimately all zombie apocalypses are one because we outsmart them because we, we survive and we get by and we're better because we're alive and we can use our brains. That's not, that's not the victory here. There, there isn't a victory here. There is based on the logic that we're given within this movie. There is no way to win against these zombies. And that's a I war of attrition. Yeah, I've never seen. There's three sequels to this. Are there three or? Uh, no, there's more. So they they did um almost immediately after Night of the Living Dead Part Two, um, a couple years after that they did Night of the uh I'm sorry Return of the Living Dead Three, and then uh there was a huge hiatus, and they came back with two last sequels that um kind of went back to that sort of like humorous thing, but they were extremely low budget. I, I think they might've been like sci-fi uh, channel movies. Ooh, really? Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually have never seen those. Um, so I, uh, I don't know if they're any good. Uh, apparently the second one rave to the grave is really good. <laughs> <laughs> That's I think so it's called great. Rave to the Grave. Oh, I, I hope it is. Since the tagline for this one is they're back and ready to party, I really it hope is. That so Yes. Yeah, so it was uh, Necropolis was the fourth one, and then the fifth one was Rave to the Grave, and they were filmed simultaneously in uh, in Romania and Ukraine. Oy. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm going to have to I'm gonna have to hunt all these down. Yeah, Sci-Fi Channel, 2005. Really? Mm -hmm. Spectacular. Uh, but yeah, so like I said, so this franchise obviously keeps going. So they, you know, they didn't end the world. But if it had ended right here, it was a plausible ending point because you yep. see that 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 we can't win. Um, so these zombies are horrifying. I also love now. Let me preface this with the fact that I love Greg Nicotero. I love mm -hmm. his work. Got to say hey to him at Spooky Empire because he was right next to V. Neil. Super nice guy. Not taking anything away from what he does. What he does is beautiful and grotesque. I love that this movie shows that you don't need a thousand dollars per zombie, right, to make them scary. It you know, and I mean, and yeah, that goes back to N Night of the Living Dead, where it was essentially just like pale face and make it dark under their eyes. I love that this kept that going. And yeah, we got Tar Man and we got woman on the, the strap to the table and we got a couple of really iconic, spe huge special effects ones. But there was never any doubt in my mind that all of these others were zombies, even though it was just like, you know, a shade of a shade of foundation that was lighter than it needed to be and some blood splattered on her dress. Like, yep, that's a zombie. And, mm -hmm. and that, that's all it takes. And that I love that they they put the money into creating a couple of really iconic ones 
And then they just gave you just enough inclination of the fact that these are also zombies and they're dead. And I, that's, I think that there's, you know, there's something really important to be said in that in, you know, the modern time of a zombie movie being, you know, okay, well, what gross thing can we, so it's like the standard is, is, is being, you know, way high. And then to create a memorable one, you've got to do something absurd. I mean, through eight seasons of the walking dead, right? You've got hundreds at one point, thousands of these things on screen at the same time. And so I couldn't tell you a single one though. Yeah, exactly. Like outside of the pilot where you've got like the one that's crawling to him. I like that was like the last one that I specifically remember a zombie because they're all just, you know, swap A for B, swap B for C. This one's missing part of its jaw. That one's missing an eye. And it's and it's gorgeous and it's beautiful and it works for there. But the zombies in this show that it doesn't have to be this incredible thing to make zombies a little bit of makeup you can pick up at your basic spirit halloween is all it takes to convince someone that that character is a zombie yeah and 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 i i think that this movie um kind of solidified that because um it comes out the same year as day of the dead right so the the romero chronology is night of the living dead dawn of the dead and then Day of the Dead. Those are the ones that um, were released at this time. And Night of the Living Dead doesn't really have a zombie that, like, uh, unless it's like the first one that you see. Yeah, like, guy oh, in the wow, cemetery, right? Yeah. The guy in the cemetery, or th like uh, one of the last ones that you see, which is the little girl that murders her mom. Like, you know, she was a character in the movie, so it kind of makes sense that they're iconic. But then you get to Dawn of the Dead, and then you can tell that there's a zombie that has more effort put into it that being plaid shirt zombie right um so um like that is an iconic zombie and then you go to day of the dead and you have other iconic zombies dr tongue which is the very first one that you see <laughs> oh God, right and, and, and they and they get names too yeah you know so um and tar man gets a name they call him the tar man like yeah, oh, the tar man got him yeah that that's all you really need is a decent design for your massive zombies. But if you can get one or two really iconic looking zombies, like the half zombie, the half woman, right? And Tar Man, you're set. But then you also have like the Confederate soldier, right? And and you have um Fake cop zombie. There, there was a midget too. Zombie. There was a midget zombie. Oh my god! Yes. yes, yes, the one that's eating the paramedics' brains, and then yes. he runs. <laughs> yeah. That that was the next one I was gonna say. You know, like these these zombies are iconic. They uh, and 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 maybe they're not in the grander scheme of things, but they are to me, and I think they should be to you. And if they're oh. not, then your tastes are questionable. Right. Oh my God. Oh, I love. I, I'm sorry. I'm still thinking about. I'm still thinking about little guy zombie running yeah. running after him from the. Ages. <laughs> it was so good because it was like because they were just like leg stubs, but it's like oh man, that's yeah. a real person's legs and that's a person running and this is spectacular. Yeah. So, I mean, so you that's that's the thing about these zombies, right? You can't win. It's they're incredible. I think that. I think that we got a good, I think that through month of the zombie, even though we ended up losing one week, mm -hmm. I think that we really hit a good, we embraced a lot of what goes into creating the genre, the zombie genre as we know, it, or sub genre of horror, whatever you want to right. call it. I think that with going from serpent in the rainbow to train to Basan and then hitting kind of right in the middle with this one. I think that we really brought on and, and it acknowledged a lot of things that have made zombies the monster in the zeitgeist that they are. Yeah, There's, you know, these are, this is not something that, yeah, right now we're in like a down period because it just got, there was just a glut of it. Uh, so if you're listening and you're like, man, after this month, I want to watch more zombie movies. Let me tell you one thing I learned while researching zombie movies, trying to figure out which ones we were going to do. Look into zombie movies made in Canada. Uh, apparently, for the past five or so years, Canada has been turning out 
just banger after banger of zombie movie. Check out Blood Quantum. Um, that's the one I can remember the name. The other one had a name in French that, and, and it, I have not watched it yet, but it seemed to just be the road, but with mm-hmm. zombies. Uh, so if, if you're looking for newer zombie movies, because you've been listening for a month now and you're not ready to move on, check out the ones that are coming out of Canada. Cause apparently they're doing the damn thing. So as we wrap up the month of the zombie, it is time for us to rate return of the living dead listening to us this is going to be another one like you know Mm -hmm. last week and kind of the week before where you're going to kind of know where we're going with this but in order to make sure that we're not comparing this movie to other movies when it comes time to rate it as we do every week we're going to create a unique rating system for this movie so we're not going to do stars because while we have talked about where it stands up against these other movies when we're rating it we want it to stand against itself so ralph i'm going to give you the option what should we what what's the metric here out of a possible five what what are we going to rate this movie oh man you know it's I can't stop thinking about zombie boobs. Can we do like a uh, five? I'm okay with zombie boobs. Because I'm, I'm are they live, but we have the green ones. It's just <laughs> it's so, a plethora of boobs. So out of a possible <laughs> five zombie boobs, Ralph, what do you give Return of the Living Dead? Oh, it, it's five. It's five for me. And I think uh, when you guys were hitting on this certain lines of the movie, I think the movie in general we haven't talked about is it's so good because the writing is so good. Yeah. And really, this same script, you just change the tone, and man, it would be it would be deep and it would be scary. They just chose to go funny with it, but the right. writing is that good because there's things that they say at the beginning and it comes back. The guy explains rigor mortis, then rigor mortis comes back. I mean, there's certain there's so it's really really well written. It's it that's Dan O'Bannon, man, because yep. like the the story is John Russo's, but uh, but he gave his novel to O'Bannon and he said. Can you turn this into a movie? And he said, I absolutely can. And then he was sure like, did. fuck, I got to yeah. turn this into a movie now. But like, if Alien is not proof that he is a master screenwriter, I mean, yeah. Yeah. what is? <laughs> All right, Dave, five zo- out of five zombie, zombie boobs. Uh, this one is going to be gold starred. I am giving this six out of five zombie boobs. Ooh. Yeah, nice. it's uh, it's absolutely perfect. I've already sat here and um, um, just absolutely gushed over this movie. So I'm not going to do it anymore. But wow, what an amazing movie. I will continue to watch this movie all the time. And if you haven't seen it yet, you should watch uh, at the very least the first sequel to this Night of the Living Dead Part 2. Frank and Fred return as different characters. And it takes place on the very <laughs> night after, or like immediately after the atomic bomb goes off and uh, the cleanup crew is taking the canisters of 245 trioxin to the government. That's that's where part two starts and hilarity ensues. I have to see uh, it. So I'm, I'm in this weird spot with this one because as, as much as I enjoyed it and as great as this episode's been, there's something that's keeping me from, from gold starring it. And I can't quite place it because I can't think of anything that's wrong with this movie. And, and I did love it. Um, but I don't, I, the, the one thing I will say is like, I don't, I don't know. There's, there's some sort of connection there that, that I just don't have. since I've only seen it twice, something like that. So I'm still going to go five out of five zombie boobs. Right, because there's just there, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. This movie is spectacular. It made me laugh. There's a little bit of emotion. There's amazing characters. All those things we've talked about. Not quite comfortable uh, gold starring it, but uh, so I'm gonna hit right at um, five zombie boobs for Return of the Living Dead. And that's not bad, right? Not yeah. not at all. Um, so there you have it. Uh, here on Shiver, we always round because uh, decimals and fractions can fuck right off. So uh, that is going to round down to five zombie boobs. Uh, apparently one decomposed somewhere. Yeah, it, so, it, happens. it happens. Yeah. Uh, so uh, two and a half pair. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I cannot say how ecstatic I am that both of you watch this movie. Daniel, I know that you know it was uh, it was a uh, a rewatch for you, but a rewatch 25 years in the making. Right. So I'm I'm so happy that you guys agreed with me because I um 
uh, number one, I love being right, and 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 uh, and no, no one was con- no one was contesting uh, my my love for the movie that it was unwarranted or anything. But um, I am so glad that we were able to talk about this. Um, if you're interested, we did uh, we being Nary and myself, we did this um, this movie back in the first season of Shiver back in like 2017 or something like that, and. Um, uh, it was done in an almost uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000 um, kind of uh, format. So you can listen to our commentary live. It's a great episode. Neri also loved it. And Neri's not a horror guy. So um, just really all, all around, um, if you've never seen this movie, don't be like Ralph and feel like you've been robbed of years of enjoyment. Go yeah. watch it now. Don't rent it. Buy it because you're going to end up wanting to rewatch it. Yeah. So that's going to wrap up zombie month here Mm -hmm. in the year of the monster. And next week when we come back, it will be April and we will be diving into vampires. Mm -hmm. So while the movies aren't exactly picked yet, we've kicked around a couple of ideas. Make sure that you head to shiverpod.com where you can find links to all of our social media. And if you follow us on Instagram and Facebook, you will know around next Monday, what movie we will be doing. We'll figure out what vampire movies we're going to be doing. We've got vampires coming up in April and we're going to be doing ghost movies in uh, May. So we've got the next couple planned out. We've also, I've got the list of ideas that everybody gave us to everybody who interacts with us on social media. We love it. There are some great ideas that I never considered that we may be able, that we'll probably be able to get around to doing a Kaiju month. I think, yeah. it, you know, is is a great idea if we, you know, we can find enough ones that are more horror, less action. There's a lot of great ideas there. So if you gave us a suggestion, I know it starts off where we're, we're, we're starting off real meat potatoes with zombies, vampires, ghosts. But we're going to get to the weird ones. We're going to get to the fun ones. I promise you that. So thank you guys so much to everybody who interacts with us, for everybody who follows us. If you could do us a favor, drop us a review on Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you listen. That's going to help move us up. We had a minute there. We were starting to break through the static. We were starting to get some more followers. We kind of plateaued now. Tell a friend about us. Get out there. You know, share with some of our posts, let people know that you like us. We'd greatly appreciate that because ultimately it's going to come down to the fact that you guys love us as to whether or not this ends up going anywhere. And like I said, shiverpod.com links to everywhere you can find us. Absolutely. So on behalf of all of us here at Shiver, fright you very much. <laughs>